Good afternoon. Wow, how nice. This morning, someone said to me, Calvin's Beatles are back together. (laughs) Yeah. I'll let them decide who Ringo is. (laughs) Um, But good afternoon. My name is Michael Arroy, and it's my privilege to serve as Calvin College's president. I'd like to welcome you to the January series 2016, and I would like to invite or remind you to silence your cell phones at this point. And while you're doing that, I'd like to give a special welcome today to guests at three of our 48 remote webcast sites, Seattle, Washington, Bellflower, California, and Pella, Iowa. We'll be gathering questions today through question and answer cards available with our ushers, or you can send your questions in by email and Twitter. So feel free to think of those questions during the presentation and start sending them in. Our moderator, Mary Holst, who also serves as our chaplain, will gather the questions and present them at the end of time if, if, uh, it, if there is time. And now, If you will please join me in prayer. Triune God, we come before you in gratitude. Today we hear from your faithful servants, George, Richard, Alvin, and Nicholas, about the ways that you have stirred their hearts and enlivened their minds to share the truth and grace of Christ in this broken world that yearns yearns for redemption and renewal. Stir our hearts enliven our minds, and encourage us all to remember that we live and move and have our being only because of you. And let us live our lives in gratitude. Amen. And now Pastor Mary Hulse, chaplain at Calvin College, will introduce our guests. Thank you. Jesus was once asked, What is the greatest commandment? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Loving the Lord our God with all our minds is the core of our work here at Calvin College. And we would be the first to admit that it's not very easy. There are challenges in Christian higher education that many of us address every day. We need guides. We need friends to show us the way. The four men we will hear from today have served as guides in this important work for many years. And for all of them, part of their service was on this campus. So let me ask this question. Show of hands, how many of you have ever had any one of these men as a teacher? (laughs) Keep your hands up. How many of you have ever read a book written by one of these men? You all get A's, well done. (laughs) You feel warm fuzzies inside now, you feel good? Because of their work, people think differently. People think differently about art and justice, evil and the existence of God, evangelicals and Mormons, Jonathan Edwards, Abraham Kuyper. People love the Lord their God with all their minds differently and honestly with more awe and more wonder and more joy because of the work of these four men. Their writing and teaching has shaped the thought lives of generations of students, and they're not done because the questions they continue to wrestle with and write about are still the questions that I hear in my office. So listen up, my dear students. For those of you who are concerned about the reality of God's existence in a world marked by evil, read Dr. Plantinga. For those of you who wonder what the Christian faith has to do with art or how we are called as Christians to act justly, read Dr. Waltersdorf. For those of you who think American religious history is boring (laughs) or irrelevant to 21st century life, read Dr. Marsden. And for those of you who wonder how to engage well with people who disagree with you over religion or politics or life, read Dr. Mao. And for those of us who are trying to figure out how to be competent academics and devoted Christians, we get to read them all. 
While these men have shaped so many, they would be quick to point to the ones who have influenced them. From John Locke to Thomas Reed, from Jonathan Edwards to Abraham Kuyper, from Harry Jellema to Henry Staub, each of these men has been shaped by those who came before. But the man who shaped them the most? Jesus. For they are not just doctors, Marsden, Walter Storff, Planica, and Mao. They are our brothers. They are also George, who's fought cancer. Nick, who's lost his son. Al, who understands life with a mentally ill parent. And Rich, who knows addiction from the inside. But because of Jesus, their lives are not cowed by suffering. George delights in seeing signs of God's beauty and sovereignty in everyday life. Nick loves a strong worship service. Al sees God's fingerprints in the mountain ranges he has climbed. And Rich is willing to return to Michigan in January from California <laughs> because his grandson is now a student at Calvin College. They love the Lord their God with all their minds because the Lord loves them. They have been created by the Father, redeemed by the Son, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to think and write and love and teach and to show us how to suffer and to show us how to stand up. Calvin College is grateful to Howard Miller Company and Miller Johnson for underwriting today's presentation. Today we welcome our brothers, and we'll do so in this order, George, Nick, Al, and Rich. Thank you. I am uh, honored to be included in this august group. And I'm not sure who Ringo, which one of us is Ringo, but I'm pretty sure I'm George. <laughs> or, or as the philosophers would say, uh, it seems to me that I'm George. I suggested this topic on the renaissance of Christian higher education because it strikes me as one of the more uh, remarkable American cultural developments of the past uh, couple uh, generations. Uh, that uh, during that time, and especially in the last 25 years or so, uh, a burgeoning, vital, and sophisticated intellectual community has developed within traditionalist Protestantism, I'm just going to call it evangelicalism for short, uh, in America. And, and the best evidence of the vitality of this intellectual community is you can go to uh, Christian colleges, there's uh, over 100 in the, in the, in the uh, Council of, for, for Christian Colleges and Universities, uh, their faculties are uh, made up of very uh, impressive uh, scholars. And, and those thousands of scholars are, uh, have their counterparts in universities around the country where, where there are more and more uh, younger, particularly younger evangelical uh, scholars uh, showing up. And, and all these people are now today participating in a very live intellectual uh, community that, that has uh, very high levels of uh, publication in books and sophisticated uh, journals and uh, internet uh, interchanges. And as Joel Carpenter has emphasized, uh, it has its counterparts uh, in, in the rest of the world. But if you go back uh, 50 years, I came here 50, <coughs> excuse me, 50 years ago last fall, 1965, or even if you go back to the <coughs> early 1950s when my elders and betters uh, came here to Calvin, uh, there simply was uh, nothing like that impressive network of colleges. In the 1950s, Calvin 
had some very impressive professors, but Calvin did not really have many peer institutions. Uh, there was hope, but that was too liberal. Uh, there, was, uh, there was Wheaton, too fundamentalist. And uh, that was pretty much it. When, it, when, when I was uh, looking for a teaching position in 1965, I wanted to teach at a, at a Christian college. And uh, Calvin and Wheaton seemed to me to be the only uh, really interesting choices. And Wheaton had such a narrow uh, statement of faith that I, uh, that I, I didn't really feel I could uh, teach there. Uh, part of the reason, of course, that Calvin did not have uh, peer institutions in the, in the mid uh, 20th century uh, was that they weren't really looking for any. Uh, many of us uh, recall how insular this place was. When, when I came here, I think the only other two outsiders on the faculty were uh, Charlie Miller and uh, Don Wilson. And with my strange non-Dutch last name, uh, I was an exotic curiosity. <laughs> I was not one of us. So what ha has happened in the, in the past 50 or 60 years to change, uh, the larger national, international uh, community that, that Calvin is, is, uh, found, now finds itself working in? Well, first of all, uh, here at Calvin, people began to discover that there were many uh, like-minded people uh, out there. I remember uh, probably in 1966, uh, Dirk Jalama organized uh, discussions with Aquinas College. And I think Al and Nick were there. We went over and talked to them, and do you really believe this and that? Uh, just finding out what Catholics uh, believed was, was, was a step. Probably we would have been astonished uh, to know that within a couple of decades, two of us would be on the payroll of Notre Dame. Uh, but now Catholic uh, scholars are, are among our closest allies. But the other thing that has happened, and it is, is something that we here uh, at Calvin had relatively uh, little to do with, uh, and that is that uh, there is a burgeoning intellectual life that has developed within the larger evangelical community. And that happened for a combination of spiritual, sociological, and historical forces uh, that uh, led to uh, the uh, broadly evangelical community being uh, the most vital religious community in, in, in uh, America in the past uh, couple generations, the one that has held its own uh, while others have declined. And that, in turn, uh, inc meant that there is a, uh, a flourishing of, of those communities, a growing affluence of those communities, and that in turn means more people are going to colleges, and some of those people are going on to universities and graduate schools, and now uh, those are the people who make up this very impressive uh, cohort of uh, Christian uh, intellectuals that, that I uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, that community uh, that I'm calling evangelical, which is a whole coalition of different things, uh, has done a good bit of broadening in the last uh, several uh, generations, just as Calvin has. Uh, almost all uh, 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 such evangelical groups had, had some sort of fundamentalist background in the middle 20th uh, century. And many of the uh, schools in, in, the, uh, co in the Council of Christian Colleges uh, at that time were essentially Bible colleges. And as late as, as uh, 25 years ago, uh, my friend Mark Knoll uh, wrote a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind and it started out saying the scandal of the evangelical mind is that there is not much of an evangelical mind. Now Mark was writing in the early 90s just as this upsurge of uh, younger people was, uh, was beginning, uh, but, uh, and, and he would agree that uh, today that, uh, that things have changed and the things that were inhibiting uh, the evangelical mind, many of them uh, have changed as well. Uh, people have moved uh, 
largely from fundamental, not entirely from fundamentalist sectarianism to, main, more, to more mainstream Christianity, the kind of thing C.S. Lewis would call uh, to mere Christianity. So uh, what did those uh, who are he- of us who are here today speaking uh, had, uh, have to do with all that? Uh, most of uh, what happened would have happened without us participating in it. Uh, and looking at the uh, phenomenon historically, uh, we were people who uh, caught a wave that was not really of our own making. Uh, we uh, sometimes were uh, all right at riding that wave and sometimes succeeded in uh, showing others how it might be well ridden. So maybe we're more like the, the Beach Boys than the, <laughs> than the Beatles. Uh, like to think that way. Uh, but probably our, our personal contributions to that enterprise are less important than that we were working within a tradition. Uh, we were all shaped by peculiar reform communities uh, in which the Kuyperian tradition had been incubating. And, and incubating might not be the best term because if you read the history, uh, it often sounds more like roosters fighting. Uh, but out of the reform squabbles of the fundamentalist era, which coincided with the defensiveness of, of Dutch ethnicity, uh, a more mature outlook began to emerge, a more progressive yet theologically uh, orthodox Kuyperianism uh, emerged. And, and so by the time I got here uh, and, and when Rich came, we found ourselves working within uh, a wonderful community that was shaped uh, by a great uh, tradition. And Calvin was a terrific place uh, because there were so many other uh, wise colleagues that we have, and literally uh, far too many uh, to mention. Uh, unlike most other places, uh, we could start our conversations not as going, having good to go back to square one, as you have to do at most uh, universities, but we could start our conversations at square three or four and argue uh, uh, from there. We just needed to do our homework, hone the tradition, uh, and articulate some of its implications. So it turned out that a, a number of the emerging uh, scholars in the wider evangelical community, turned out they were uh, attracted to what we were doing. Uh, They brought additional traditions uh, from which they had come and could interact and added their own contributions. So exchanges were always two ways. But the result was that the sorts of things uh, that we were trying to articulate here at Calvin uh, found wider audiences and more conversation partners. So now the intellectual community that does not have to go back to square one uh, is much larger. Uh, than it was 50 years ago. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say that it's become one of the most vital intellectual communities in America. I'll let the others fill in some details. great to be here. I thank those who've made it possible to be here with these three colleagues that I've known and cherished for many years. Our topic, as you know, is the remarkable renaissance of Christian thought that has taken place over the past 50 or so years and the role of Calvin College in that renaissance. George has sketched for you a picture of the development in general. Now what I'm going to do is narrow the focus and speak about the renaissance of Christian thought that has taken place within my own field of philosophy. Counterpart talks could have been given for history, literature, and so forth. I graduated from Calvin in 1953 and was a grad student at Harvard from 53 to 56. I was aware at the time that there were philosophers in Christian, in, in, uh, that there were Christians in philosophy. I knew that Bill Franken, a Calvin grad teaching at the University of Michigan, was a Christian, as was John Wilde, one of my teachers at Harvard. 
But very few Christian philosophers wrote anything that was recognizably Christian. The main exception to that generalization was O.K. Bausma at the University of Nebraska. Bausma was a graduate of Calvin. <laughs> Today, there is a society of Christian philosophers with about 900 members. The big philosophical organization in this country is the American Philosophical Association, and the APA has lots of affiliate organizations. The Society of Christian Philosophers is by far the largest of those affiliates. As one would expect, a good many, good many members of the society hold teaching positions in the Christian colleges of the country. But there are a lot of them who hold teaching positions in major universities. At least 10 members of the Society of Christian Philosophers have been presidents of the APA. So in short, the society has become a major presence on the American philosophical scene. And the question that I'd like to address briefly with you is this. How did we get from there to here? How did we get from almost no philosophers writing anything that was recognizably Christian to our present situation of there being hundreds and hundreds of such philosophers? And what was the role of Calvin College in that renaissance? Well, after getting my PhD from Harvard in 1956, I spent a year in Europe, taught for two years at Yale, and then returned here to Calvin in 1959. Al Plantinga, who had been a fellow student of mine here at Calvin, returned here to teach in 1963. And thinking back in retrospect, I think that there were three aspects of LMI undergraduate education here at Calvin, and two features of our graduate education that proved crucial for the renaissance of Christian philosophy. Let's start with the three features of our undergraduate education. First, our professors, especially Harry Jellema and Henry Staub, inspired us with a gripping vision of how to be a Christian in philosophy. We didn't have to figure it out for ourselves. The motto we were given was that of the medieval theologian Anselm, namely, faith seeking understanding. Not faith added on top of understanding, not understanding propping up faith, and certainly not faith instead of understanding, but faith seeking understanding looking at philosophical issues through the eyes of faith. Or to say the same thing in other words, engaging in the discipline of philosophy with a Christian mind and Christian sensibility. The, Christian, the vision we were given, this is important, the, the vision we were given was not defensive. The second feature of our undergraduate education here at Calvin that proved important for the future of Christian philosophy was that there was no index of forbidden books. No one, no one deterred us, for example, from reading the virulently anti-Christian philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. As with everything else, we were to engage Nietzsche with a Christian mind and sensibility, but nobody said that Nietzsche was off limits. You see the importance. Christian philosophy was not a hole and corner thing. It was not defensive apologetics. And third, we were invited to regard the entire tradition of Christian thought as our heritage. Protestants sometimes assume that true Christian thought began with the Reformation, or maybe with the Wesleys, or maybe with the Azusa awakening in the beginning of the 19th, 20th century. But what we were taught here at Calvin was that the church fathers were part of our heritage, that the medieval philosophers, Augustine and Anselm, were part of our heritage, and so forth. The whole lot of them. For our later discussions with Catholics, that would prove to be really important. Those are the three aspects of our undergraduate education. Now for the two aspects of our graduate education. 
that proved important. First is this. The philosophy that Al and I were taught when we were students at Calvin was almost exclusively history of philosophy. Our professors at the time were doing almost nothing by way of teaching and writing philosophy themselves. By contrast, what our graduate school training hammered into us was what we called at the time doing philosophy. So when Al and I returned here to teach, we didn't just want to study philosophy, we wanted to do philosophy. And second, our graduate school education had put us in touch with the American philosophical scene in general. I'm not aware that Harry Jellamo or Henry Staub ever attended a convention of the American Philosophical Association. As George indicated, Calvin was insular in those days. But Al and I, from the beginning of our careers, not only attended but made presentations at conventions of the APA. Both of us have, in fact, been presidents of the APA. That's all background. Now briefly, how it actually went. As I recall, I haven't done any research. <laughs> Shortly after I and Al were together here at Calvin, Al and I were together here at Calvin as professors, we and the other members of our department decided to meet every week to discuss something that we ourselves had written and distributed in advance. We always met on Tuesday afternoons. Rich joined us in the fall of 1968. And for the remainder of my career at Calvin, we met every two, for two hours every Tuesday afternoon, often straight through the summers, and went page by page by page through whoever's paper had been distributed in advance. Any comments about page one? No more comments about page one? Then let's all move on to page two. Who's got anything to say about page two? And so it went. I think you can surmise that it was tough love. <laughs> I want to say candidly that it was in those Tuesday meetings that I learned how to be a philosopher, and in particular, how to be a Christian philosopher. Alan and I knew philosophers at Notre Dame. So sometime in the late 60s, the idea emerged of the Calvin philosophers getting together every now and then with the Notre Dame philosophers to discuss philosophy. You see, we thought of our Catholic colleagues as co-workers in the project of Christian philosophy. So for some years, I don't remember how many, we met twice a year, alternating between meeting here at Calvin and meeting at Notre Dame. And as I recall, it was from those meetings that there emerged the idea of opening up our discussions to others than just Calvin faculty and Notre Dame faculty by forming a society of Christian philosophers. Others were brought into the discussion, I think especially of the late Bill Alston and of the two Adams, Bob and Marilyn Adams. The society was officially organized in 1978, and it took off. It took off. I had the sense of a dam bursting and of a river surging forth. The society is wonderfully ecumenical in its membership. The only requirement for membership being that one declare that one is a Christian. We didn't think that in the modern day and age there would be all people, kinds of people not Christians who would want to be members of the society. Uh, very ecumenical. Nonetheless, I think I can safely say that the two dominant traditions of thought are the Reformed and the Catholic. Let me close by saying that I feel enormously privileged and deeply grateful to have been a participant in this remarkable development and to have taught here at Calvin for a good many years with these three dear friends and with many others like them. Calvin College remains an exceptional institution. In my judgment, it is easily the best of the Christian colleges, and it ranks, I would say, among the very best of the liberal, college, liberal arts colleges generally. 
Nobody else, for example, has anything like this January series. That said, those days were a golden era in the history of Calvin and in the history of Christian learning. It was in many ways here that the Renaissance began. Thanks. First of all, let me say it's a very great pleasure to, be, to take part in this panel. Uh, some people, as I've discovered, impolitely refer to us as the Over the Hill Gang. <laughs> These people fail to note that it is age alone that confers maturity, judgment, wisdom, insight. <laughs> of course, Rich Mao and George Marsden over here, being only about 75 years old, are, are a little young for these qualities. <laughs> They're not perhaps quite dry behind the ears. Still, they do seem to be coming along nicely. <laughs> um, also, I'm obliged to correct Nick on one point. Nick said that Professors Harry Jellema and Henry Staub never attended meetings of the American Philosophical Association which is the uh, Professional Association for Philosophers. If I remember correctly though, and Nick thinks I don't, <laughs> if I remember correctly though, Henry Staub and some others of us once drove down to Chicago to attend such a meeting. And on the way back, we got into a violent argument, a really ferocious argument about a certain bottle, a bottle of water. The bottle was in fact half full the question was whether it could have been at that very time, whether it was possible at that very time and place that that bottle should have been empty or completely full, or anyway, something other than half full. <laughs> Professor Staub argued with, as I recall, great vehemence that it was essentially half full. That bottle just then couldn't possibly have been any other way than the way it was, namely half full. Our topic is the Renaissance and Christian philosophy. However, I'm going to stray just a bit from <clears throat> the assigned topic. I'm going to ask instead a bit about the nature of Christian thought, and in particular, the nature of Christian philosophy. So, uh, so what is philosophy? I suspect that for some of you, that's not really the burning issue of the day. Uh, too bad, but there it is. On a common understanding of philosophy, however, philosophy is a wholly disinterested, not, notice, uninteresting, but disinterested attempt to answer a certain set of questions. These questions have to do with the ultimate nature of reality, whether there is such a person as God, whether there are objective values, including an objective right and wrong, whether human beings just are their bodies, whether, for example, I just am this, this body, whether there are two kinds of substances or only one or maybe none at all, and so on. And the idea is that philosophy is an attempt to answer these questions in a disinterested way. It's a disinterested way attempt to answer those questions. Our Roman Catholic friends and allies and I think a lot of our Roman Catholic friends and allies, I taught at Notre Dame for many years, 28 years. Our Roman Catholic friends and allies following the impressive 13th century philosopher Thomas Aquinas think this way. So for example, the uh, 20th century philosopher, Catholic philosopher Etienne Gilson put it like this, he said, whereas the philosopher as such professes to draw truth from the spring of reason alone, the philosophical theologian draws truth from two different sources, from reason and, since he is a theologian, also from faith revealed by God. So the, this idea is that philosophy is, in that way, disinterested. As Jill Sohn says, it proceeds by reason alone, with no room for faith or scientific truth or common sense. 
I should add parenthetically that uh, quite a few people seem to agree that philosophers don't display much by way of common sense. <laughs> In answering these questions, so the idea is, you can only appeal to reason itself, and in particular, you can't appeal to faith. Thus, the eminent contemporary philosopher Thomas Nagel speaks of philosophy as the view from nowhere, the view from nowhere. And I can remember as in grad school at the University of Michigan, Professor William Frankina, himself a Calvin graduate and a member of the Christian Reformed Church, telling us that if in working at philosophy, you appeal to what you know or think you know by virtue of faith, then what you're doing is really theology, not philosophy. Now back in the day, some 60 years ago, uh, when Nick and I went to Calvin, one thing we learned from professors Jellema, Harry Jellema, and Staub, Henry Staub, <clears throat> was that this whole line of thought is eminently questionable. And maybe the first question is, uh, why should we think of philosophy in that way? Who gets to decide or legislate that philosophy has to be disinterested? Why can't there be such a thing as an explicitly Christian philosophy? Not Christian theology, mind you, but Christian philosophy. As far as that goes, why can't there also be such a thing as Christian science? Not the, maker, the Mary Baker Eddy kind of Christian science, but rather a science that starts from Christian ideas. In working at any science, you take a great deal for granted. For example, you take mathematics for granted. You take also uh, a lot of common sense ideas for granted. You take it for granted that we are at or near the surface of the earth. You take for granted that we breathe air and not water. You take for granted ideas about how microscopes and telescopes and other instruments work. Why can't you also take for granted the main lines of the Christian story? If you're thinking about a problem, maybe how to repair a hole in your roof, you ordinarily employ everything you know. What kinds of roof boards and shingles are available? What kinds of shingles will last the longest and provide the best um, protection against the elements? And so on. It wouldn't make much sense to artificially limit yourself to just a part of what you know about these things. Well, why shouldn't it be the same way in answering these philosophical questions? Why shouldn't you there too use all that you know in answering them? Why shouldn't you use what you know by way of faith in answering them? Of course, many like Bill Frankina will say that if you do that, then you're not really doing philosophy, you're doing theology. Well, okay, maybe so, call it whatever you like. The important thing is to answer those questions and what you, what you call the process of answering them isn't all that important. And if it isn't important, I will call it Christian philosophy. <laughs> so, so I say there really is such a thing as Christian philosophy. From my point of view, that's a very good thing too, since that's what I've been trying to do for the last 50 years or so. I need to uh, begin by saying how pleased I am to be on the platform with these fellow panelists who are also uh, cherished friends. The other three, pre three presenters were actually the persons who drew me to the Calvin College faculty in the late 1960s. Al Plantinga had been my teacher at the University of Chicago when he taught a seminar there as a visiting professor. Nick Mollersdorf had not only influenced me by his writings in the Reform Journal, but I had also attended sessions where he presented papers at the American Philosophical Association. And I can still remember reading in my graduate school days uh, an article that greatly impressed me in Christianity Today by George Marsden and thinking how great it would be to work alongside of a person with his insights into the evangelical movement. Joining the Calvin community then was for me a dream come true. And the dream kept going for the 17 years of my time on the faculty here. Now, this is a good occasion also to explain publicly, and you're hearing this for the first time, uh, why I left Calvin to join the Fuller faculty in the mid-1980s. 
The truth is I had no intention of leaving, but I entertained Fuller's offer only to use as a bargaining chip with the Calvin administration. <laughs> Well, at a certain point, President Diekma called me into his office and he said that he heard that I was thinking about moving to Fuller. What can I do to keep you at Calvin, he asked. My well-considered reply was that I would stay at Calvin if he would appoint me as head coach of the men's basketball team. <laughs> his immediate reply shocked me into the realization that I had overplayed my hand. Without a moment's pause, he said, go to Fuller. <laughs> and the rest is history. In all seriousness, my clear sense in leaving Calvin was that the Lord had given me the gift of working closely with an amazing community of colleagues and students. And now he was saying to some of us, take what you have learned here into new areas of service. Within the span of a few short years then, Al went to Notre Dame, Nick went to Yale, George went to Duke first and then on to Notre Dame, and I had departed from Fuller. And there were others also who joined our diaspora during that same period, to name only a couple of the obvious examples. Uh, Mary Stewart Van Leeuwen moved to Eastern University, Steve Monsma to Pepperdine, Dale Van Clay to Ohio State, and Paul Henry to the United States Congress. And we all went with a sense of mission to bring the vision that had inspired us here at Kelvin to other important academic and cultural contexts. For me, that context was uh, theological education, where Fuller Seminary was and is seen as a highly influential center for theological scholarship. Lou Smeads had moved from Calvin to Fuller the year I arrived in Grand Rapids. I like to think there was no causal connection there. <laughs> and as he was nearing uh, retirement, he made it clear that he saw me as stepping into the, his role as the representative of Calvin College Kuyperianism at, uh, at Fuller Seminary. In part, this meant for me that I would keep teaching at Fuller much of the same material that I had taught at Calvin. For example, I regularly assigned Abraham Kuyper's lectures on Calvinism to my Fuller student. And I'll never forget a response to that assignment from an African-American student in one of the first courses that I taught at Fuller Seminary. I love what this Kuyper says, she told me. Not that I agree with all of his Calvinism, she was a Pentecostal, but what he gives me is a Jesus who shed his blood for my sins and who also cares about justice. Now her testimony expressed a more general longing that was beginning to be articulated in new ways in the evangelicalism of the final decades of the 20th century. Many Pentecostals, Baptists, Wesleyans, conservative students from mainline denominations, people in university campus ministries, large numbers who were flocking to new, uh, new style emergent congregations. They were looking for a robust evangelicalism that embraced a gospel of saving grace that spoke also to all areas of life, politics, the arts, economic systems, the sciences, and a concern for the marginalized. For those of us representing the Kuyperian world and life view in those settings, the challenge has been to respect the theological diversity of evangelicalism and broader patterns while finding ways to mine the specific traditions uh, for Kuyperian-like themes that can enrich the more general patterns of present-day scholarship, case in point. During the past two years, I've been invited on several occasions to address audiences in the Wesleyan holiness tradition about how they can articulate within their own framework the kind of emphasis on Christ's cosmic lordship that Kuiper gave expression to in his Every Square Inch of Creation Manifesto. I've reflected with them on John Wesley's oft-quoted statement that the world is my parish. Too often that's been distorted into a church-restricted sense of Christ's rule, as in my parish is my world. 
But another way to understand Wesley is as insisting that the fullness of creation is a kind of parish, a rich and complex expanse in which Christ calls us to serve the cause of his kingdom. The first time I met Dr. William Spoolhoff, another of my heroes in my life, was when I was interviewed as a potential faculty member here at Kelvin. I'd gone through the process up to the point where a lot depended on whether I received the president's approval. Those were the days when persons from non-CR backgrounds were, uh, CRC backgrounds were a rarity on the Calvin faculty. George has already mentioned that uh, there, were, there were three. And those three were different than me because to make matters worse, I'd been raised in the Reformed Church in America, <laughs> which made me highly suspect as opposed <laughs> to a George Marsden who had been raised Orthodox Presbyterian and had actually studied at Westminster Seminary. In expressing my gratitude for the formative times, um, I'm sorry, uh, and, uh, and President Spoolhoff uh, focused on two issues in our conversation. One was whether I was willing to support the Christian school system. I received high grades on that one when I told him that I'd attended Riverside Christian School in Patterson, New Jersey, which turned out to be his alma mater. <laughs> uh, the other issue was my fit with the college's vision for liberal arts education. And Spolov, Spolov made his point forcefully and memorably. To put it in stark terms, he said, if on one evening the college's worshiping space were burnt to the ground at the same time as the entire religion and theology faculty died, Calvin would be as Christian the next morning as it had been the previous morning. What makes this a Christian college, he said, is what we teach in chemistry, sociology, literature, and all the other disciplines. Now, my guess is that Dr. Spoolhoff's formulation was starker than what he really believed. But his basic point was clear and profound. Christian liberal arts education isn't just about attaching worship activities to a generic conception of the world of ideas, nor is it just about required theology courses. All of that's important. But to make that point in those days was to state something about the uniqueness of our reformed understanding of higher education within the larger Christian movement. And today, as George has pointed out, that point is widely accepted in the Evangelical Academy and those of us, like the four of us here on this panel, have been privileged to be out there while seeing that vision take hold in new ways. And we can do so with profound gratitude for what we are able to be a part of uh, in here at Calvin College. I, uh, Al and I were present uh, one evening at Calvin Christian Reformed Church when the great Henry Staub uh, preached a wonderful sermon, a classic sermon on John 3.16. Now, Henry Staub was a great uh, articulator of the vision of John 3.17. He liked to point out that the word for world there is cosmos, that the, that the sun came into the cosmos, not to reject or condemn the cosmos, but that the whole cosmos and all of its created diversity might be saved through him. But that evening he preached on John 3.16 that the cosmos can be redeemed because God sent the Son in the world, into the world to save lost sinners, uh, the likes of us, from our depravity, doing for us on the cross of Jesus Christ what we could never do for ourselves. And to me, that was one of the most profound themes here at Calvin College, that we were grounded in a conviction, in a set of convictions about our sinfulness, about the sovereign grace of God, that came to us through Jesus Christ, who is our only comfort in life and in death, but is also the Lord of the whole creation. I thank God for my time here at Calvin College, and thank you. We have some time for questions. If you'd like to tweet them, use the hashtag January series. You can email them to jseries at calvin.edu. 
You were also handed cards when you came in. If you raise your card, one of the ushers will collect it and we'll bring them forward. I get to go first, though. I'm curious, gentlemen, as you survey the landscape of uh, Christian academics and academics in general, what's an area of academic inquiry that you think really needs a reformed Christian touch, that really needs some attention from our faculty, our students, and uh, people who share our values? Well, I, I, think, I think one of the obvious things is the natural sciences where, uh, you know, I think back in those days, uh, we would have been surprised to know about some of the more recent uh, debates about young earth and things mm -hmm. of that sort. We just did not uh, uh, countenance much of that kind of thing in our time here at Kelvin. And I think this is one of the, the really big challenges of uh, how do we think about uh, the book of Genesis and the origins of the human race, the origins of our sinfulness without mm -hmm. relinquishing what needs to be seen as the heart of the gospel. Well, at the same time, uh, <coughs> you know, the great Bernard Ram, who I once invited to speak here at Calvin, uh, wrote a book in the 50s called The Christian View of Science and the Scriptures, where he took on theistic evolution and, and, and the like and got in a lot of trouble for in the evangelical world. And uh, when he visited here at Calvin, I said to him, uh, you ever regret writing that book? And he said, no, because I never wanted a student of mine uh, to go on to Harvard and lose her faith because I had not dealt with these issues uh, honestly in my class. And I think Calvin has been a good example of uh, that kind of posture, but we need to apply it in new ways today. I think, um, I, think I kind of agree with Rich. Um, <laughs> it, makes, it makes me really uncomfortable, but uh, <laughs> uh, but you can't have everything. So um, it, this, it's, it seems to me it's really important that science, generally, at a place like Calvin and thought of, as thought of by Christian educators and intellectuals, science generally should be somehow seriously integrated with Christian belief. Now, in some parts of science, maybe that doesn't really work. I don't know. But in other parts of science, it really does. And it, typically it isn't, um, and it should be. Part of the reason that it isn't is that, of course, uh, we people who graduate from Calvin and come back to teach at Calvin go to graduate school. Where else? And in graduate school, uh, topics of that sort don't have any currency or indeed any standing at all. So it's something that has to be worked up by ourselves from inside our own community, and that's really a tough job. George? <laughs> I, I, I think I would, the, the other thing I would say is that, I, I think, I mean, this is pretty traditional to say, but the areas that make a Christian college distinctive uh, are you know, often, with nothing against the sciences, but often in the humanities, and that uh, this is what's being lost in most of higher education, the ability to sort out issues in a larger perspective. And, and we have a hugely fragmented culture, and, and what Christian communities of colleges have to offer is how do you cope with, with, with this fragmentation, and, and, and it can be done in this kind of community in a way that is, is, is wonderful and really can't be found much in you know, other places. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to pick up on George's comment and affirm it. Um, when I went to Calvin College, the sense I had was that I was entering the intellectual life of my community. When I taught here, I had that same sense. I still have that sense. That, it seems to me, is what we and at Calvin must preserve, that this is where an important part of the Christian community thinks together, does its thinking. Um, there are a lot of places, a lot of colleges and universities that are turning into job training organizations. I have quite a bit of contact with the Free University of Amsterdam. 
Um, the Free University was once definitely the center of Dutch Reformed intellectual life. It's almost become a job training institution. They have virtually abolished, for example, the, treaty, the teaching of ancient languages. Now I find this just, at the time of the Renaissance, the Netherlands was the center of translating and editing and publishing and so forth. And to think that that's all gone. So, so what we've all got to do, I think, is, is, is it's not that I'm against having courses in business administration and not teaching young kids how to teach, but, but we must not lose this sense of here, here we treasure, preserve, advance Christian thinking. I was struck. Yeah. Nick, I was struck when you were talking about how you were taught at Calvin um, that you were encouraged to take a non-defensive posture. Yeah. And I was wondering from the four of you, what are the spiritual disciplines that academics particularly need, particularly as Christians, when it feels like we're often under attack or our beliefs are, we need to present in a way that is in some way defensive and yet to take a non-aggressively defensive posture. What are kind of the spiritual habits that we as Christian academics need to develop? I'm glad you uh, asked that in terms of spiritual habits. Uh, that's a good question coming from the Dean of the Chapel here. But uh, <laughs> because I, I do think, uh, you know, that example I gave from Dr. Spohoff, uh, Worship is very important, and spiritual formation is a very important part of the larger experience of being formed for participation in the life of the mind. Uh, and I think uh, one, of the, one of the things that Nick was talking about, uh, that, that there was a, a, a sense of a generous intellectual hospitality here, that we were willing to entertain ideas, even things that Nietzsche said. And, and not just refute him, but saying, is there something here that we see as maybe a word of judgment on mm -hmm. our own Christianity or, or something that mm -hmm. he's sensitive to that uh, we haven't been sensitive to? And I think that we can't divorce that kind of intellectual hospitality from a, a spiritual hospitality, a, a, a humility, a sense that uh, uh, God is God and we're not, and that we're finite. Uh, and that we're sinners, and that we have a lot to learn. And the non-defensiveness, I think, uh, for those of us in the Calvinist tradition, it ought to come naturally, but the fact is, it often has uh, been just the opposite. So, I yeah, what, Mary, uh, what, I, what, oh. what I had in mind was, um, so, so after I'd been teaching here a while, then I would speak, be invited to speak at evangelical colleges, and what, what struck me is how prominent apologetics was there would be courses in evidence, yet more evidence, yet, yet more evidence. I remember John Montgomery, for example. And by comparison, our teachers, you're, we're Christians, right? Um, let's begin to look at the world, life, reality, human beings in the light of that, how, how it looks. And of course, you answer, you answer the objections when they're posed but you don't allow the entire enterprise to become defensive and apologetic. Yeah, I think, um, I think what's important here is a certain, a certain amount of Christian courage. Christian courage yeah. may be Christian optimism. Um, if Christianity is correct, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. Uh, we do believe it's correct. We should present it in that way. We've got nothing to be apologetic about. There is the science of apologetics or the discipline of apologetics that I myself have been engaged in a lot, but I don't think um, Christians ought to apologize. Um, they should do apologetics, but not apologize. <laughs> I, I, Rich mentioned humility, and I, I'd say that's the spiritual discipline to, to, the trick is to be firm and have courage about what you do believe, but be generous about what you don't know. And Christianity is, after all, about human limits and what needs to be done about that. And let's recognize our limits at the same time we're saying we have something to say. This could go on forever, but our time is up. So the 
I know, that's how I feel. Uh, the gentlemen will be available in the lobby. If you have other questions, they'll be signing books. Let's thank our brothers for being here today. <laughs>